to introduce Dr. Doctor, Doctor, Professor Jonah Raxton, Doctor of Jack London. Yeah, <laughs> PhD of Jack London. Um, <laughs> um, and you just told me that in the last month he has been in San Francisco for two events. He was on a panel discussion and he facilitated a discussion with City Lights. And so, you know. We are really, you know, he, he, his fame goes beyond just here in Sonoma County, but all over the Bay Area and his expertise. So we're really lucky. He's a legend in his own You're a legend in his So, enough of me, Gapna. And uh, I see those of you who wanted to get, we have uh, more copies of Jack London and the Town of the Moon magazine free for the taking. These are our raffle tickets. If you stick around, we'll have a raffle. Um, some of Jonah's books, and we have a couple passes to the park that the park will need, oh, which is the yeah, grand yeah, prize. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You're very yeah, welcome. So, so enjoy. Uh, I believe that it was Lisa's idea to have events about Jack London here in the library. Uh, so this is the fourth one here. We did two in February. We did one earlier uh, this month, and, and this is the last one in, in here in this library. And I have, after this event, I have one more Jack London event to do this year, and that is at the Kenwood Chamber of Commerce. Uh, uh, <laughs> Yes, there, there's, uh, there's more interest in Jack London in Northern California than any place else in the world. I suppose it makes sense because the park is here. He lived in, in Glen Ellen. Uh, um, he, was, he was most definitely a Bay Area writer. He grew up around the Bay. He, he sailed and fished and did all kinds of things. He, uh, in the Bay itself, and it spent uh, born in San Francisco and raised in Oakland, and then in Glen Ellen. So this is this is the Bay is this is the center uh, of his world. Um, interest uh, in Jack London. Also, I did get phone calls and emails from people wanting to interview me about Jack London. Um, two two people from Germany. Um, and then the BBC last week, and then just today I got somebody uh, from a, a, a French uh, radio station. So there is some, there is some interest other, other places uh, in, in the world. Um, I did also go to the park in, uh, in June with some seventh, seven and eight year olds, seven and eight year olds <laughs> from, um, uh, the, the school over there on Arnold Drive, and uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the, I went with the teachers and with 60 students, and the teacher said to these seven, eight-year-olds, you, you, you can't run around, you have to stay together, uh, there's poison uh, oak here, and there's rattlesnakes, uh, and, and, and you know, and always telling them what to do, and and then they said to me, "Well, you, you seven-year-olds, you can't talk very long. You need to about to seven and eight-year-olds. You probably eight minutes is the maximum." So, well, first of all, the kids get to the park and they're running all over the place. Yeah. They're going under the trees, and the, yeah, of course, this is what you have to do. Jack London would have approved. You have going wild, and so. Um, I talked very briefly, um, and afterwards there were questions from the kids who were really bright. They uh, sort of one kid wanted to know, well, why did he die at the age of 40? Which I found like that's difficult to, uh, for me to explain to like seven-year-old why does somebody die at the age of 40? And then uh, another kid wanted to know. Um, uh, how was he able to write 50 books in about um, 16 years? And I said, boy, I had a really good imagination. And they, they, the kids like that, you know, I mean, imagination. And then one of the things that I uh, mentioned to, uh, to them was that Jack London had been a hobo in the, when he was a teenager in the 1890s. He, he crossed the country by rail without it, without buying a ticket and riding the rails, and 
they had never heard the word hobo before, these kids, and so they were going around saying hobo and hobo, you know. <laughs> and, and so, and then they all, you know, they had thought that they wanted, they said, John, we want to be hobos. What, what do we want? <laughs> <laughs> of course, uh, it's been a fun year, and uh, I mean, I've learned a lot of things about Jack London. Uh, surprising things, I'm happy to say. Uh, before I came over here, I stopped over at the community center and there was somebody probably, he's, he's probably called a custodian or something, and um, he was fixing something over there in the building and I said, uh, you know, I really thank you very much for, for keeping this building going. And he said, well, I thank you very much for writing about literature and literary matters. And then he said, have you ever read Jack London's The Road? You know, how, where, where, where can you go where somebody who's like fixing something that's broken down a building starts a conversation about Jack London? And, so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful place to be uh, for, for Jack London. Um, uh, let me say some things about, is it all right if I talk some a little bit about Jack London and John Barleycorn? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. Anything you want to do. I, I have read John Barleycorn many times. This is, this is the edition that I have uh, more than any other. And then I recently bought this edition. Uh, an Oxford classic. It has, this has a really good introduction by a uh, English scholar about Jack London, and then there's these uh, these editions of, uh, uh, of Jack London. So I um, I know that when I first uh, read uh, John Barleycorn, I there was a lot of things about London that I that I learned. Um, I wrote down a bunch of things on it, you know, on the, the back of the book. Uh, uh, he says, uh, in one place, I'm afraid I always was an extremist. And I think that that is, here he is, he's pretty accurate. A lot of times Jack London said things about, about himself and, you know, he, he didn't get a really good read on himself, but anybody who writes 50 books in 16 years and travels, or that's, that's pushing it, I would say. Uh, um, or uh, goes around in 1905, uh, starts out in Berkeley and goes to Harvard and Yale and all, all around the country and urges students to um, have a violent revolution against the, the, the wealthy and to take their property. It's not a kind of moderate, I would say. It's not a moderate fellow, you know. Um, uh, or anybody who drank to the extent that he drank. And, you know, a lot of these things are certainly controversial. A, a friend of mine who's a docent said, oh, you know, Jack Lennon did not drink in moderate. He was a very moderate drinker. I have done research. I went to the Huntington Library. That's where they have most of Jack on the papers, and I saw it, you know, there was his wife kept a record of how much they drank, you know, two bottles of champagne before dinner and a bottle of red and a bottle of white, you know, that is moderate drinking, he said to me. Well, I don't, you know, not by my standards, I would say it's not really moderate drinking. Uh, smoking cigarettes, you know, the guy had a, you know, he was, he, he was definitely uh, burning the candle at all different ends and traveling around the country and he was here, he was farming, he was ranching, he, 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 there, he was inviting people from all over the world to come to, to Beauty Ranch as he, as he called it and hobos and anarchists and translators, uh, artists, bohemians, uh, it, it was a, a, a very uh, lively place. So that, yes, I'm afraid I was, was an extremist. And another one which took me by surprise, uh, he said, I was curious about all things that made me plastic. Well, you know, made me plastic. I, it's not part of my, I don't say I'm a plastic guy, you know. I know there's the, the line from 
uh, the Dustin Hoffman movie, The Graduate, and somebody tells him to go into plastics. Well, <laughs> that is not what <laughs> Jack London was talking about. And I, I don't know, for quite a while I was doing research. Well, what the hell was he talking about here about plastic? And other places he talks about plasticity. And he probably got the word from the, these words and the concepts from Nietzsche, who wrote about them. So what, did, what Jack London means, and it's really, I would say, goes to the core of who he is. He likes the idea that, and he likes people who can change their identity, their persona, their form, and can fit in to all kinds of different environments. So they can go to the Arctic, and they can fit in there. They can go to the tropics. They can. They can be in artistic circles. They that that they're uh, you could say that they're morphing all the time. And and he's he's a guy who's continually uh, changing who he is. And sometimes so he seems like he ends up being the opposite of of who he was when he started out. And I think people who who understand Jack London see or recognize that he's he's a guy with a lot of contradictions. So, uh, make money, and he wanted to buy things, and he was into all the latest technology of his time. He had a telegraph machine and a telephone up at the Beauty Ranch, and he had a, dic uh, a dictaphone. I didn't know he could record himself, and his wife would listen and, and type type it up. He had his own fire engine. So if he was alive today, he'd, he'd be uh, he'd be twittering and tweeting, and he would be with all the latest technology, in my view. Uh, so a lot of other, there's a lot of uh, information, yes. Yeah, so of that kind of thing, and then um, there's also I would say another. <coughs> there's Jack London's uh, sort of opinions or statements. Um, uh, there's a couple of descriptions here about his, wanting, his attempts to commit suicide or wanting to commit suicide. Uh, uh, and, and a lot here about, his, about drinking and about alcoholism. I don't know, one thing that I'm not sure of is to what extent was he actually drinking alcohol when he's writing this book? <laughs> so, or did he finally kick the habit of alcohol? I, it's uh, for me reading this over. It's it's hard to for me. It's hard for me to tell. Um, it, sometimes he seems to say that he's you know he's given up. He's finally conquered his this uh, taste for alcohol. Uh, <coughs> And other times where he seemed like to say, you know, no, I've never been able to beat alcohol. Or there are some places also where I would say that he has a, um, he writes about um, what it's like to be intoxicated from the point of view of an alcoholic. Uh, where the world is kind of, kind of blurry, you know. There's, so there is, there's this description he has here. Um, uh, when he was a teenager, he decided that he wanted, this is in, it's in chapter 12, uh, where he decides that he wants to commit suicide, and he goes down to the Carquina Straits, and, and he walks to the end of a pier, and he, he falls into the water, um, and uh, he, he's, uh, 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 he says, oh, this is great. I'll, I'll, this will be the end of my life. This is a great way to end my life by committing suicide. And he's, it was a hero's death. So I struck up my death chant and was singing it lustily. Uh, and, and then he, it, the water is so cold that it kind of wakes him up and revives him. And he says, oh, gee, I don't really want to die after all. And, <laughs> And then he says, but, but it was too late. I was too far out, and there was no way that I could save myself. But then, at the last minute, he's rescued by a man he identifies as a Portuguese sailor. So that is, 
Jack London's books are full of characters who jump into the water and, and are drowned or are rescued. It's, it is a, a repeated kind of motif, probably because this is something that actually happened to him, and he uses it in, in The Sea Wolf, where his main character, like, uh, he falls off a, one of the ferries in San Francisco Bay, and then he's picked up by Wolf Larsen and, and his boat and taken out to sea, and he uses it uh, in Martin Eden, where Martin Eden goes aboard, at the end of the book, goes aboard this uh, liner and lets himself out the porthole and disappears under, in, in the sea, never, never to be seen again. Um, so reading, rereading John Barleycorn this time, I did go back to this description of himself where he's drowning off the Carquina Straits, and then uh, a few pages, not further on, he, um, he says, he, what I would say, he takes uh, drowning, the word drowning, and begins to be using it metaphorically. And it, did, it does seem appropriate. A man who's an alcoholic and who's losing consciousness is a man who's drowning. And that's, that's a large extent the way he sees himself. He says, it was as if I were drowning before a crowd of spectators who thought I was cutting up tricks for their entertainment. And then a little bit later on, I was no more myself than a drowning man is who continues to struggle after he has lost consciousness. Uh, Jack London loved to write about also characters who are losing consciousness and regaining their consciousness. People just as they're fading out and what the world looks to them as they're fading out and then how the world li looks to them when they're coming back from some kind of other state and, and, and seeing the world and feeling it and experiencing it. So I would say, for me, the key word in this book is drowning, mm -hmm. a book about a man who's drowning. He's drowning in alcohol. Uh, Did the people around him t talk to him as if he was an alcoholic? Did his wife treat him like an alcoholic? Uh, yes, his wife did treat him like an alcoholic. I would say so, yes. Um, uh, to, um, to jump ahead, I, I might as well say it here now. Uh, uh, Charmian um, London, Jack's second wife, uh, kept a diary and she wrote a couple things that to me are interesting about John Barleycorn. The first thing that she said that's of interest to me is the object of this book, which is more or less autobiographical, with the artist's touch of exaggeration in order to point his morals is to make the world a better place for youth. Okay, that's the first thing that she says. Uh, and then the second thing, she said, Jack London has in mind to write his alcoholic memoirs. Now, some of the books say alcoholic memoirs, and some of them do not have subtitle alcoholic mem memoirs. I mean, there's a lot of variability in these different Jack London editions. But he thought of it as his alcoholic, well, he called it his alcoholic memoirs or his alcoholic reminiscences. So the other thing that Charmian said, this is in the, while he's writing John Barleycorn, Jack intends to drink moderately in the future to prove to an unbelieving public that he is the opposite of an alcoholic that he is not afraid of alcohol and never was an alcoholic. Perhaps he is right, but I feel a trifle dashed. She knew him, she knew him really well. Uh, uh, so when he says he's going to drink moderately in the future, he, she, she has reasons to, to wonder, is he going to be able to carry through? He, he had, well, I said that he had parties at uh, Beauty Ranch, one of his friends, and who had a saloon in, in Oakland would pre-mix huge batches of martinis and send them up by rail to Glen Ellen. There, there were two trains a day in those days that arrived in, in, in Glen Ellen. 
Um, so this book is it's also called, when I Googled it, it's called an autobiographical novel. Elsewhere it's called a memoir novel. It's also been called a temperance tract. So I think that people have had difficulty or it's been a challenge to figure out, well, how do you label this book or what part of the library or bookstore do you put it? Uh, the title is from uh, the, a traditional British folk song, John Barleycorn, and John Barleycorn, you, you might all know, is the personification of alcoholic beverages. Um, I did want to say some things about the genesis of the book. Um, in July of 1912, the editor of the Saturday Evening Post, which was a big magazine back in those days, it was until I was a boy, the editor, a man named Churchill Williams, wrote to London and said, I recall a half-formed idea of yours to put into type the experiences of a gentleman in liquor and out of saying, how about it? So uh, he must have yeah, heard uh, Jack London tossing the idea out and, and here he is coming back and you know, how about it? And uh, a month later, uh, London sent a telegram to the editor saying, I can start writing John Barleycorn immediately. It'll be about 50,000 words. You can exercise free fist in editing. I want 15 cents a word. Will be an epic maker. Will be a personal experience. Now comes the point. I must have an advance of $1,000 by in, by in a week. A thousand, another thousand dollars in two months, and the balance on delivery of the manuscript. That is also Jack London. If you know Jack London, he's always negotiating about money and how much, how much per word. And he's, and then he also, when he sends the manuscript off, he can He actually, I don't know if he did it himself or he got charming to do it, but to count all the words. And if you see his manuscripts, these handwritten manuscripts. Uh, uh, he, wrote, he puts down the exact number of words at the end. If somebody shortchanged him for like $3.25, he got it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, um, so after he'd sold uh, the rights to the magazine, the Saturday Evening Post, he, what he did, and this is also typical of him, he got into, in touch with a book publishing company called The Century Company, and said that he wanted it, he negotiated a book contract after it came out in serial form in the magazine. He asked for another thousand dollars and he predicted that it would sell a hundred thousand copies. Nothing like this has ever been written before. I've already arranged for serialization. Um, he began to make uh, notes for the book. Uh, well, some of the notes were recipes on how to make different alcoholic beverages and, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and also a kind of sociological uh, account of, of society, you know, wealthy people, what kind of drinks the wealthy people have, what, could, what are working class people, what are, what, what are middle class drink, people drinking. Um, uh, and uh, I learned from this edition uh, of, of uh, Jack, oh, excuse me, John Barleycorn, that while Jack was working on John Barleycorn, he was reading uh, a pretty well-known book at the time by William James, Henry James's brother, and the book was called *The Varieties of Religious Experience* and. Uh, uh, yeah, the John Sutherland, who edits this version, thinks that what, that what uh, London wanted to do, he took, borrowed the idea from James and he wanted to write uh, varieties of alcoholic experience, not varieties of religious experience. And, and, um, in this book, he uses the phrase white logic, and he got the phrase white logic from reading William James. And, uh, 
he, part of the time he was working on this book, he and Charmian were sailing uh, on, a, on a ship called the Dirigio, and, and uh, London was reading William James, and he was making notes in the margins and all around the book, and he wrote down one of the sentences from William James, the white logic that enables us to see through all the vital lies whereby we live. Oh yes, I'm still not sure what the what the white logic is. Really? Well, he definitely said it's beyond rationality. Yes. So, and then in in John Barleycorn, he says the white logic is quote the argent messenger that reveals truth beyond truth, the antithesis of life, cruel and leak as interstellar stellar space, pulseless and frozen as absolute zero, dazzling with the frost of irrefutable logic and unforgettable fact. Wow, that's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> what do you know? Maybe he's just having fun, like tossing out all these metaphors. And it, it's cold, it's hot, it's the antithesis of life, it, it reveals truth, it's it, it's, uh, it has to do with interstellar space, uh, irrefutable logic. He's a poet. He's having fun just like, I would say, piling up words. So uh, he finished the book. Um, he sent it off. It was a little bit more than he thought it was going to be. It was 66. 1,896 words, it was written, he wrote it all out by hand on plain white paper with a fountain pen, uh, and he gave it to a professional typist, not to Charmian. Charmian did a lot of the, t a lot of the typing, uh, most of the time, or much of the time, and uh, uh, she was a pretty good typist, but they, they felt that he was not, uh, she was not up to the, what was demanded here. So Jack London was paid $10,000 for serialization in the Saturday Evening Post. It came out in, in seven different sections from uh, the 15th of March of 1913 to the 3rd of May 1913. Um, and then it was published as a book in August 1913. Um, I would add that 1913 was a bad year for Jack London. He was operated on for his appendicitis. His doctors saw how bad his kidneys were and said, if you continue to drink, you're going to curtail your life. A frost destroyed his fruit crops. Wind burned his corn, locusts ate his eucalyptus trees. Um, he kept going. Um, in 1913, before it came out as a book, he went to L.A. to discuss John Barleycorn becoming a movie. And it was made into a movie in 1914, uh, uh, starring Elmer Clifton and Viola Barry. I don't know, I don't recognize those names from, from those days. Um, that would have been silent. Silent movie, yes. Yeah. Silent, you know, silent movie. Yeah, this is this is like oh, more than ten years before the talkies came into existence. Yeah. yeah. So he was down in this period of time. He was down in Hollywood a great deal of his time, negotiating contracts and also getting involved in lawsuits because uh, all kinds of uh, copyright law had not been really worked out in terms of books and movies or transferring books into movies, so there were all these movie companies that were, uh, uh, without getting permission, without buying the rights to make movies, they would just start filming them, and he'd find out about them, and he'd take them to court, and so he was in court a lot in, in L.A. Um, so there's a couple of things um, that he said about John Barleycorn that may or may not be helpful in understanding the book. But I, yes, so I also say that um, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, uh, which was wanted prohibition, um, used 
extracts from John Barleycorn to promote the cause of pro uh, prohibition. And it was his idea to approach them and get them to buy copies and to distribute copies. Um, so, all right, the things that he said, okay, in May of 1913, he said, I've tried to present, I've tried in John Barleycorn to present the liquor problem from the human personal side, and I have strong hope that it will produce some good result, especially among young boys and young girls yet to be born. Um, also said, whatever I have accomplished in this world has been in spite of John Barleycorn and not because of John Barleycorn. John Barleycorn never helped me to do anything. Um, soon after that, he, he got a letter from a, a reader in Tennessee who wrote to say that he liked the book and, and Jack London wrote back to say the only trouble I must say about this book is that I did not put the whole truth in. All that is in it is true, but I did not dare put in the whole truth. And he stops there. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> he seems to be saying the exact opposite or something very different and this the second letter was to the head uh, the man who is the head of the Anti-Saloon League of America, so it could be that he's saying the things to people what, knowing what they want to hear. Uh, and this other comment, John Barleycorn is frankly and truthfully autobiographical. There is no poetic license. It is a straight, true narrative, toned down, not up. And then he adds, the way to put a stop to the drinking of liquor is to put a stop to the drinking of liquor. In short, the only way to stop it is to stop it. Uh, maybe easier said than done. <laughs> yes. um, so I guess my uh, um, big question, if I have one really big question about John Barleycorn, which I may you know, ask you, uh, is does it matter whether Jack London put in the whole truth or not? Does it matter whether it's an autobiographical, we call it an autobiographical novel, or, 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 or we call it a memoir, you know? And if you want, we can continue sitting this way, or we can get in a circle, or, Anybody have any preference here? You know, whatever. Anybody have any preference in either way? Are you okay being where you are and speaking up? You know, does it matter? I mean, I, yeah. What What do you think? You know, is the guy lying? What is if he's lying? What is he lying about? Or is he just telling fictions? He, 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 uh, and does it affect how you uh, how you respond to the book? You know, if you read if you read uh, somebody's book and and it, it, you hear that it's an autobiography and then you and then it comes out no no the guy just made up all these things about himself. You know, does that? What did he call? What did he call it? Did he call it a novel? He called it a, his a, a, his alcoholic memoirs. Alcoholic memoirs. Yes. Oh, that seems so, pretty clear. Yes. So, but it, but if you if you're writing your alcoholic memoirs, does that mean that you're they're under the influence of alcohol when you're writing them, and therefore you're they're not completely reliable? Or again, was at least the one I posed at the time was, does it matter? You read the man; he writes superbly. A hundred years ago, when he died. Uh, he probably had a hundred more books, you know, left in him. I don't think that it is relevant whether he was or was not an alcoholic. I don't think it is relevant whether he committed uh -huh. suicide or not. Uh -huh. um, okay. Both could be true. Maybe okay. he drank himself to death. But that's not the point. Jack Lennon was a wonderful writer, and we read him, and that's why we're here. Okay. And that's what counts. But what is it that makes? Uh, what is it that made Jack Lennon the writer that he was or became? His experience, and I guess it would be easy to just jump right back in and say, he wrote from the heart, or he wrote from the white logic, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, okay. You know, he, he had brilliance. Yes. And he was an observer. Yes. Very precocious kid. 
yes. um, helped along, uh, of course, um, you know, to survive what were very difficult times. And not just survive, but thrive. Uh, you know, he was, I guess, a genius. Yes. Right. Yeah. Uh, so that's why he was able to write as he did. And that's why he was able to write what he wrote. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. so the biography doesn't really matter to you. Is that what you're saying? But it's, Do you I know, know, yeah, I guess, Jonah, I, I, I would have to say, if you want to put it in, in that kind of a nutshell, I'd say, no, the, the biography doesn't matter. Uh -huh. okay. What matters is that he wrote and that we can read him and that his influence is worldwide mm -hmm. okay. in all those languages and, and all of those people that have still found some understanding of the world and life uh -huh. in reading him. Okay. Who cares? Who was he? I don't know. Yeah. Meh. All right. Meh. All right. Yes, please. Uh, well, as far as being autobiographical, I think to some degree that's never a full truth anyway, no matter who writes it, because you're coming from your own perspective and your own bias uh, versus yes. versus a biography, which, which somebody else is really examining and identifying the different things that happen and perhaps in, in um, evaluating um, interactions with the, with the writer and getting into their head. It's just a different thing. I think it doesn't really matter if, it, if it's autobiographical and if it's accurate. It would be interesting, though, to know what the other part was that he didn't say, the other part okay. of the truth. That would be really interesting. Okay. And for me, I mean, the thing that made him so brilliant was that he could, you could just, you just get grabbed in his stories and you don't want to quit. Uh, he just really captures you with his descriptions and um, um, just that whole. So you so you want to you want to read the book until it's done, and then you're like, oh, well, it's done. That's too bad. Go on to the next one. Um, okay. All right. So would you consider yourself like a Jack London fan, or? or? I would say yes. I everything I've read. I haven't read all of his books, but everything I've read, I absolutely thoroughly enjoyed and. and uh -huh. Recommend to anybody. Okay, and did you start like when you were really young? Or? You know, uh, uh, no, I didn't. Uh, kind of an interesting story because yes. I was a uh, dyslexic kid and I didn't learn to read until I was a third grader, <coughs> and so I didn't really read books until I got into college. Oh, okay. And then when I started, I just have kind of um, um, I can't put them down. Um, now, I just love to read, and when I did read him as an adult, I never read him as a kid, when I did read him <coughs> as an adult, I was like, wow, these are really amazing stories. Okay, yeah, all right. So do we, do we uh, are there, is everybody here like familiar with Jack London and read Jack London? And, or, yes, you are, yes. Anybody like coming across Jack London for the first time and willing to say, you know, it's okay, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I go places and I say, oh, I'm, uh, they say, well, what are you doing tonight? Oh, I'm going to talk about Jack London. I'll say, well, who's Jack London? You know, there's a lot of people, there are many, many people who do not know anything, who do not know, they don't recognize the name. If I were to say Norman Mailer, they wouldn't recognize Norman Mailer. They would recognize Shakespeare, yes. But that's, the, <laughs> the, that's like the, the state of education. And, uh, in the United States today, you know, there's, there's most of you, like your, everybody, there's nobody under the age of 30 here. So you've all grown up like reading novels and it's been part of your education. Uh, uh, I taught at Sonoma State for 30 years and, and uh, you, you have to stand on your head a lot of times to persuade the students to read a novel and mm -hmm. to stay with it. So it, it, not the way it used to be. Yes, sir. I just, just an observation uh, in the book. I, I found it very interesting that he was uh, more interested in, in social revolution. He was more interested in, in uh, his daring, feats of daring do, yes. swimming ability. The very last thing he was interested in was writing. It was uh -huh. the God-given gift. That's the way I see it, that he was least interested in, maybe because uh, it was so commercial to him. 
Well, near, near the end of his life, he just he said uh, a number of times that he would rather be doing things on his farm, on the ranch, than, than writing. And, uh, I mean, he loved to ride horseback on Sonoma Mountain and walk around, but he did continue to write. He was writing until the, until the very end of his life, and there were books that didn't get published until after his death, so he couldn't stop writing. John, yes. Yeah, if we take that to be the case, that he's not in love with the actual doing the writing, why did he write this book? Is he coming clean, or is he making money? Is he having a political agenda? What's going on here? Okay. I mean, well, I, own, I have an opinion about You have an opinion? Well, yeah. well, I'm just curious. You want to hear what I have to say? Yeah, please. Okay, well, based on what I know about the whole of Jack London, based on what I, on the letters that he wrote, uh, I know they wanted to make money. I don't know any time in his life when maybe, well, even his very first uh, publication, you know, he won twenty-five dollars when he was just a kid. So he he he, died. he wanted to he wanted to buy land. He wanted to buy uh, eucalyptus trees. He wanted to buy horses. He didn't want to just like have money. He wanted to have things. So I think that he also, uh, it meant a lot to him to have to write for a cause. He, he, he was always writing for some kind of cause or another. It could have been socialism. There's a whole lot of essays and lectures and talks that he gave about socialism and traveled around and, and talked to people. Uh, he, uh, what, what other causes? I mean, he certainly cared about like animal rights. I mean, at the end of his life, he's like, you know, there were these Jack London clubs in, in, uh, that were formed to, to protect animals, and, you know, against cruelty of animals in vaudeville acts. And, uh, that went on in, in his lifetime, and, and uh, they were very popular clubs, and, and, and he loved animals. Um, so, it, it, there's always some kind of cause, I would say, for Jack London. And, and so temperance or abolishing <coughs> alcoholism is, uh, is one of the things that, that, he, that he cares about. But you want to say, well, why did he write this? Well, I would agree with exactly that. I never took it as a biographical thing at all. I say there's a nugget of biography in it, and that he is, uh, as you said, wants to make some money out of it. Yeah. So we can be outrageous. We can stretch the truth a bit. And he has a cause behind it, and that's the whole difference thing. Yes. I always look at it as a political book, not yes. as a book of, of memoir. Okay. It's, yeah, I could, yeah, so I, I mean, I have to admit that I can't back that up. It's been 25 well, years since I read it. But it's okay. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he is probably, he's, my guess, or I, my, I would say, yes, he's thinking about himself, the fact that he started drinking about it at a very early age. You know, I, he says, I love saloons. I mean, partially, because of the alcohol, partially because of the camaraderie of man going into the, being a man, and part of being a man is like being able to drink and hold your liquor and, and all that. So he wants to, to prove his manliness. Uh, um, am, am I correct that he draws, uh, that he's tying socialism into this alcohol business, though he's saying? Being an alcoholic or the consumption of alcohol, overconsumption of alcohol, is driving people, the working man, down. Did he pull that? I am I remember not that? aware of him doing that. I, uh, the working man is not being able to pull himself up and not being able to revolt, not being able to better his life because. Well, I believe that Jack London was opposed to giving women the vote. But he said that he would vote for women to vote because he thought that would be the only way that women would ban alcohol. Men were not capable of doing it, so he would be willing to give women the suffrage to do that. So mm -hmm. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know any place where he connected. Like I mean, I could see that. Like I'm just thinking of like you know Emile Zola, the French novelist, where. It looks the, the, the working class people are like their the alcoholism is like it's part of the whole problem of mm -hmm. of, of, of the French working people that they're uh, they're beaten down by the by labor and toil and, and the way that they 
get through their lives is by drinking and deadening their pain. So. Of course, Swan and Wilder, the longest journey of the night, is all about gradual descent into alcoholism and the destruction of the family. Yes. Yeah. But London's writing don't seem to be like that. I mean, it seems to be, he's not a classical alcoholic. It just, his life just degenerating on the alcohol. He kept creating stuff. Right, at the end of right. The yes, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, yeah, the thing about Jack, whatever's going on with Jack London, he's still he's still creating. He's dead. There's all kinds of trauma and uh, and angst in his life, and and he's making art and out of all of that stuff that's going on inside of him. And you know, um, the, I remember a professor of mine said that you know all all the great artists are neurotic have some kind of neuro they're, they're creating their art out of their neuroses. It's better that they not get go into therapy and resolve this all because then they won't <laughs> 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 Lionel Trillian, his professor of mine, made that argument. <laughs> you know, he would say it's better that people are in the closet. If they come out of the closet and then everything is good, it's better that they in you know, they're in hiding about all these things and <laughs> they're funneling it into their creativity. So I think there's some of that in Jack London. Well, the fact that he wrote a whole book about it suggests that he was consciously and intentionally doing it. Just trying to come to terms with it and see what it yes. was. Uh, what does it mean that there's alcoholism going on and I participate in that? Mm -hmm. It seems like he's not lost in it. He's not lost in it. Well, I got the feeling he was really curious about the whole thing about it. I mean, for a lot of the book, he says, I was not born an alcoholic. It's not natural to me. He says it over and over and over again. And then at the very, towards the end of the book, he finally talks about how he used to just drink at supper beats so that he could stand being with a whole bunch of people. And as time goes by, then lunch. Yes. And he would start drinking at lunch. Yes. But never when he was writing. And then... During, during the middle of the morning when he was writing, and then before he started writing. I mean, it was a real interesting progression, and he just, he told it, like, and that's why I, I felt like you, like, I don't really, he, it sounded like he stopped at some point, but you, you really can't tell for sure. Yes. Well, he died three years later. Now, was he still publishing uh, other books that had renown in the last three years? He, yes, he's still, yeah, he's still he's still writing and all kinds of books and very productive and very creative until the end. He's got all ideas for all kinds of books that he never had time to complete. So where where, where is this book in the, in the sequence? Of it? This is it last was published book? in 1913. He died in 1916. So this is near the end of his life. Mm -hmm. He's written most of his books already. Mm -hmm. He's he know the doctors have told him that if he goes on drinking, which he's he is continuing to drink, he knows mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. that he's gonna curtail his life. Mm -hmm. And uh, he you know at one point he says you know I I want to uh, I'd rather be a uh, I'd rather burn up than rot to death. I, I'd rather be a meteor, you know, or streaking mm -hmm. across the sky and, mm -hmm. and briefly. Mm. than just existing, merely existing. Mm. Mm. I'd say, I mean, Valley of the Mount, for me, is, is one of Jack London's great works of art. Mm. Yeah. It, has, it has a woman heroine, the main woman character. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first part of it is about working class life in Oakland and what that's like, and, and the labor movement and the labor struggles. And then uh, the two main characters are go on the road by foot and they, they walk off all around Northern California. They visit the Bohemians in Carmel they, mm. uh, and, and uh, fun and games there and then they come up to Sonoma and they buy land and they decide to homestead, which is what London <coughs> did. So, John, I do have to say, sorry for interrupting, but I do have to say that um, I had signed up about six months ago for the Jack London State Park reading of Valley of the Moon, which yeah. is coming up. And so I thought, oh no, I've only got a few more weeks and I better pick it up and start it. 
And I had read it over, I guess, 10 years ago, and I, yes. I enjoyed it, and I didn't have, you know, many problems, and some of the things about um, kind of racist things that he brought up in the book, you know, at the time, I thought, well, that is of its time, and I did enjoy reading the book. Mm -hmm. Um, so I started reading it again, I didn't get very far in, and I just had to put it down, and then I yeah. picked it up again, and it was the day after the election. Yes. And I was reading about um, sex in the main character, yeah. and just how she looked, and she's this perfect specimen, you know, of a woman, and yes. her blonde hair, and I ended up throwing the book down. Yes. I haven't picked it up since. <laughs> I will go back at some point, yeah. but it was just, I felt in that moment, I just felt kind of this, this anger, like, um, mm -hmm. I feel like we've come so far as a country, and yet here I am picking something up that it just resonated on that particular day yeah. after yeah. the election. Right. Uh, there, I understand there are times when I've picked up a Jack London book and started to read it, and I don't think I've thrown it across the room. But I just, I just that, you know, I'm not, I've never done that before. Interested. And then sometimes maybe I'll go back five years later and I'll pick it up and I'll get into it. But it, I think that happens. Yeah, happen. That's yeah. our experience. I was kind of surprised. Where we read a book, uh, when we read it, what time in our life is it? I mean, there's a there's a novel exactly. that I always wanted to read. Uh, I think it was called The Quiet American by uh, Graham Greene. Mm -hmm. And I took it with me to Vietnam. It's set in Vietnam when the French are there, and I read it in Vietnam. Uh, and it made a lot of, it, it, it resonated with me because of where and when I read it. Or, or uh, uh, I, I mean, I, there's other examples of books that I could, you know, give of where and when I read it. When I was a boy, and it just, and it hit me, or, like music, I think. Or, uh, you know, there's sometimes I'll go to a movie and, and I'll just weep in the movie and then I'll see it again. Well, why was I all work so worked up? <laughs> it does, it does happen. So, um, did, I think somebody here said, you know, you wanted to know, well, what did he leave out of this book? So um, there are things in this book about uh, his mother. There's certainly things about his mother, things about his life. You know, he says it's going to be very personal. He talks about his drinking. And so uh, the, the things that he left out are that Jack London's biological parents were not married when he was born. His mother, Flora Weldon, lived with a man named William Henry Cheney in San Francisco in the, in the 1870s. She was, she was pregnant. He, she told him, he asked her to have an abortion. She refused. He, uh, he, he left her. Uh, she did a couple of things. One of them was that she drank uh, laudanum, which I believe is opium mixed with alcohol. She had a gun. She put a gun to her head and pulled the trigger, and the bullet grazed her head. I am purposefully not using a certain word here. What? Because people say, well, no, she wasn't trying to commit suicide. What, what was she? I'm telling you, you know what she did, but what was the motive? Why was she? Why was she doing that? So um, Flora gave birth to his son. She called him John Griffith Cheney. The birth uh, announcement in the uh, in the Chronicle. Also, all the all the troubles that happened with between Flora and her common law husband was written up in the Chronicle in 1875. Because the the editor of the Chronicle thought, oh, this is a great juicy story. Our readers will want to read about this. You know. Woman pregnant, a husband or a common law husband wants to be a suicide. So um, Jack London's mother, Flora, did not tell him anything about this. As far as I know, she never said anything about this. When Jack London was about uh, 20 years old, he was uh, in love with a woman named Mabel Applegarth. 
uh, kind of maybe a station or two above his own family in Oakland. And her brother said to Jack, um, you know, uh, uh, John, oh, so excuse me, I left out that Flora married uh, a man named John London and changed the, her son's name to, to, to John London. Uh, and John thought, Jack London thought that John was his father. He didn't find out until he was interested in marrying Mabel when her brother said, you know, you're, you're not, uh, or John London is not your father. Your real father is living in Chicago and his name is William Henry Cheney and you, you could find out what's going on. And so Jack London wrote him a couple letters and got back two answers. Uh, saying, uh, thank you for writing, I, uh, I can f I'm, have a sense of what kind of emotional distress that you're in. <clears throat> I'm not your father. I did live with your mother in San Francisco. Uh, she had a whole lot of other boyfriends. I'm an old man, I can't help you. I was impotent when I lived with Flora. Um, so, uh, and leave me alone. I don't have any money and leave me alone. So, um, as far as I know, there's almost no place in which London says how he felt about receiving these letters or learn, getting this information about, from, about his own parentage and growing up. Um, there's one letter he wrote to, uh, to Mabel's brother in which he says, right after he gets the letters from his father, I'm feeling really depressed. And the next thing that we know is that he went to the Yukon to prospect for gold. Or that was ostensibly why he says, I'm going to the Yukon to prospect for gold. Does it take a great therapist to sort of conceive <laughs> that there may be some connection to that? I'm going gold prospecting. I so, so George, to come back to your comments, I um, I have found that that uh, whenever I start to talk about the books, people want me to talk about the life, and when you go to the park. People don't give you like the plot summary of the sea wolf. I mean, they will men say some some things, but they're mostly talking about biographical information about what went on at, at the ranch and the animals and Jack's ideas. People are people want to know about this guy's life. 